Hi guys, so suppose you have a source of light, let's say it's here, and it's moving with some speed, and you're witnessing it from over here, and you see the light uh, arriving from this source, and you look at its spectrum, okay? So it turns out the spectrum of light is going to be shifted slightly. The fractional change in the wavelength of the light, that is the change in the wavelength divided by the wavelength, is equal to the speed of the object divided by the speed of light, as long as the speed is much, much less than the speed of light. So we'll assume that's the case. So that's one idea. The next idea you need is Kepler's third law. And Kepler's third law basically says that if you measure distances in astronomical units, and you measure times in years, and you measure mass in solar masses, that if I have an object that's orbiting, say a, another object, so we have a mass m, that's the mass of the central star, and then I have an object that's much less mass that's orbiting it, and so it feels a force toward the center, its speed is <clears throat> along the direction of motion, there's a force that way, that, uh, that there's a relationship between the period, the uh, radius of the orbit, the period is the time it takes to go around, and the mass. The relationship is that the radius of the orbit cubed divided by the period of the orbit squared is equal to the mass. And again, that's assuming that R is measured in astronomical units, that T is measured in years, and that mass is measured in solar masses. Okay? So what that means is if I know the time and I know the mass, I can work out the radius. And if, and if I know any two of these guys, I can get the other one. That's the second idea. And the last idea has to do with the center of mass. So the notion is, let's say I have a fairly massive object, like a star, and a fairly low mass object, like, for example, a planet. The center of mass is a point between the two. And I'm going to make some dotted lines here to indicate where these guys are. I call this distance big R, and this distance little r. And I call this mass little m, and I call this mass big M, okay? It turns out the ratio of the distances is equal to the ratio of the masses. But obviously, it's some kind of inverse proportion, where big R divided by little r is equal to big M divided by little m. Or another way to say that is that little m times big R is equal to big M times little r. Mm -hmm. And if you think about that for a minute, you'll notice that if they orbit one another, the, the little mass goes around like so, and the big mass goes around like so in a certain period of time. So in the same period of time, the little mass goes around and the big mass goes around. So they orbit in equal times, but the little mass goes much farther than the big mass, so his speed is much higher. The distance the little mass goes is proportional to big R, and the distance the big mass goes is proportional to little r. And so if I calculate the mass times the speed, the mass of the little guy times the speed of the little guy, which is going to be much higher because he goes so much farther in the same time, is equal to the mass of the big guy times the speed of the big guy, which is going to be much lower because he travels in a very tiny little circle. So this is the notion that the center of mass stays fixed, and the location of the center of mass is close to the big mass and far from the little mass. And it basically says that the momentum of the little mass is equal to the momentum of the big mass. It makes sense because while the little mass is going this way, the big mass is going this way, and um, the total momentum is zero because the in the picture right here, the little mass has a momentum 
toward the top of the page, the big mass has a momentum toward the bottom of the page. The two momenta are equal in magnitude but opposite in direction, so they add up to zero net momentum, which is the total momentum of the entire system in the center of mass frame of reference. That's the idea. So the notion is you take those three relationships, the one that r cubed divided by t squared is equal to m, so if you know it's a one solar mass star and you know how long it takes for the thing to go around, you can calculate the orbital radius, big R. Then you take the fact that big M times little v is equal to little m times big V. This tells us if we know the mass of the planet relative to the mass of the star, then and from the distance and the time, we can work out the speed of the planet we have everything we know to compute the speed of the star. Once you have the speed of the star, then you can go to the Doppler relationship and figure out the fractional change in the wavelength, which is just the speed of the star divided by the speed of light. So with those three ideas, you have everything you need to know to predict with a known planet, known mass planet, and a known period of a planet, you can work out how much shift you would expect in the wavelength of the light that the star is producing. And you can imagine that you can work that thing backwards, too, that if you measure a star's wavelength shift, you can work backwards to find the mass of the planet. That's, that's the basic idea.